So like I said, this, this month we're going to talk about unit testing and I think the best way to start with unit testing is we'll start from an empty slate and we're going to just build the pieces of an app out um, bit by bit. So right now I'm basically, I created an, a blank um, folder called brew controller and what I'm actually doing is a front end, I found out that you can actually run Node.js on Raspberry Pi and I've got like a Netduino, which is like an Arduino version of a uh, brewing controller that will actually monitor the temperature of my, uh, my brew kettle and keep it level. And, and I can actually set it up to say, I want to start out for 10 minutes at a certain temperature. And when it reaches that, it'll time it for 10 minutes and then it can switch temperatures. And it'll, it'll manage the temperature of, of my word as I'm uh, um, doing my mash to create my to create the work that I'm gonna brew, and so what I want to do is I want to move that to Node.js and on the Raspberry Pi, and I've already written it once in plain JavaScript the front end, and then I wrote it in Knockout JS. So now I'm like I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite the whole front end using Angular. So tonight what we're gonna do is I've, I I know what the the back end needs to look like, so we're gonna write a service that will talk to that back end and. Then we'll also build a, a couple of different uh, front end displays for it. And that way you'll get a good example of how to write unit tests for everything. And um, so we're going to start out with this blank slate and I'm going to actually use Yeoman. And we're going to use the Angular generator and I'm just going to go ahead and kick that off. And what should happen is it should come up and ask me if, a couple of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and include Bootstrap because I, I want it to look like everybody else's application. Although I don't use Compass, so I'm going to say no on that. And then um, I actually don't need any of these because all I'm going to use is ng route. I don't need the resource because this is going to be a fully functional API. So it's going to be things like set temperature, get status, put profile. So I'm not really going to use resource for that. I'm just going to go ahead and um, use, um, well, I'll just create HTTP stuff. So all we're going to use, we're not even going to use any of those. So. I'll go ahead and we'll hit, so we're not going to include those modules. Now he's going out, he's pulling everything down off the web and they're all the, the node packages that you need and then copying out templates uh, that we'll, we'll need to basically start up the app. And once we're done, I'll switch back over to WebStorm and I'll show you the application structure. It should actually even run through and kick off Karma and run the, the unit test. So one thing about the Angular generator is whenever you create a new service or a new directive or a new view, a new controller or a factory, it actually will also create um, a corresponding uh, test file for you in a directory structure. So everything went through, it ran all this uh, tests, so we're good here. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip over to here and we'll refresh our directory structure here. And so what I have, and I wish I could make this bigger, but so we, we have the basic structure. We've got a test folder, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time today, which is going to be underneath here. So like it, it always creates a main controller for the app. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, and it also creates a test for it. And the default test is let's let's just check to make sure that there's actually an array called awesome things in there and it should be like three items long because that's what their default code does but we'll get in more detail of how everything is structured as we as we build more stuff out but so so they create a test file and if we actually go up here and look in the app folder under scripts you'll see a controllers folder here, and this is the actual controller that it's testing. So this is a basic generic controller. It doesn't really do anything. All it has is this default of array, this default array in it, and their test is just making sure that that array has three items in it. That's all they're doing. You know, but this, again, this is template code. And every one of these you do, it's gonna be like that. They're gonna just create this simple, template for you and your job is to go in and take out the default stuff and lay stuff down. So the first thing I know on this controller is so it's, we're gonna, and we're going to use this main controller. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give you an idea of what the app looks like right now. 
I'm, a, I'm typing grunt server, and that's going to basically go through, compile, and then kick off the grunt server for us, and it should launch uh, Chrome here in just a second. And so this is what you get as a default, which is their little, their little screen, and it, sh and it dumps out the three items that was in the array. Um, so if we actually go look at the view over here, so if we, and under views, they put all the views. So this is really, um, the way that they've structured the app is based on um, function, or what I want to call it, functionality, or not functionality, but by layer. So all the controllers are in one folder, all the directives will be in one folder, all the services, all the views are in one folder. Whereas if you did it functionality, you'd have a folder for the main controller, and it would have the HTML, it would have the, the JavaScript file. So if you notice, all they're really doing here is they've got you know the LO, LO, and now you have, and then they've just got a list item that they're doing an ng repeat on to dump that data out. So basically, all the dynamic content on this is right here. And again, this is just to get you, let you know that everything's up and running in this. So we're going to now start modifying this project, but we're going to do it in a test-driven way. So we're going to break the main controller, and then we'll go fix it, and then we'll go add more functionality to it. So we'll start with that. So I'm going to go back, and we're going to default to the, um, the main um, test file. So how many people are familiar with ja Jasmine test framework? One or two? OK. So, this is con so Jasmine is considered to be a behavioral-driven development um, test framework. So what you do is you describe a, a scenario so like, uh, or a feature. So in the, at the very beginning, they describe the controller and the name of the controller, controller main controller. And then um, you basically describe the functionality with it statements, like it should attach a list of something awesome, or a list of awesome things to the scope. So that's, that's what you're checking functionality wise. And, and you can write up anything, like it should go request this from the server, or it should have a, you know, it should have X amount of things. So like if you have initialization code and you expect things to be initialized when the controller is created, you can check those conditions. And th the way everything is done is the commands are like it, and then they, you have a string, and then you actually punt, you, you provide the function here. Um, is what you're actually doing your testing against. Now, if you need to have certain things done before each test, and you need to you know you need to set preconditions up. You have things like before uh, commands like before each. So in the case of with Angular JS, um, the Angular mocks library, which is actually loaded on top of this, provides a command for Jasmine called module. So before each test, we're going to instantiate the module brew controller app, which is my app's controller or module. So if we were to actually look up here at app.js, you know, this basically actually creates that module that it's going to instantiate before every, um, every test. So that means that any of my controllers, and if you look at your controller definition, you know, it basically hangs on to onto module, right? So the fact that the difference between this one and app.js is, if you notice, app.js has the square brackets here for dependencies. So that's actually creating the module, because if it doesn't exist, and it'll list in the dependencies that we have on that module. Whereas in our controller, they don't have that comma array of dependencies on it. So it will go out and find that module and then return it back. So, and that's, that's the way you use module. That way you don't have to store a global variable of your, your app module. You use it this way. So, everyone, so as far as our test is concerned, what we're going to do is we're going to, that very first line there, before each with the module and the name of our app module, it's going to go out and from those JavaScript files, it's going to load up it and all its dependencies and then instantiate it for you. That way when we use like the, uh, the controller um, method here, we can actually call out one of our controllers and it will find it in the dependency injection list and bring that for you. you know, so, and, and then it will, we can actually even provide it, and we'll get into this a little bit more detail, we can provide it 
a object that has all the services or all the dependencies it needs that replaces the default dependencies. So, and this is actually what goes on behind the scenes whenever you use an ng view or anything like that. It actually does this in the background. You just don't ever use it. Uh, we always do our stuff via route. So, so, that, so the first thing is we need to make sure that the modules we're going to test is loaded. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And then we're going to create some um, variables for our test scenario that are going to use beyond it. So you'll see us use main control and scope quite a bit throughout this, this test scenario. And the main controller is basically going to be, is going to be our controller, and then the scope is going to be the scope that the controller uses. And we can then make, we can actually call methods from our controller because they're all bound to that scope. So what will happen is that scope we pass in will come into here, and all this stuff will actually get assigned to it. And that's actually how they're checking this down here, scope.awesome things. Because the controller will actually assign that to the scope variable for you. So the other thing we need to do before we start our test is we actually have to instantiate the controller. And that's, that's where they say here, initialize the controller and mock your scope. So by default, we're, we're going to basically, before each test, we're going to call the inject function and we're going to say, hey, I, I want you to call this function and I want you to pass in the controller object or the controller service and the root scope service. And then what they're doing is they're assigning they're creating a new root scope. So that's going to create a child under root scope and assign it to the scope. And then they're going to use the controller to actually create an instance of main CTRL, which is our controller. And then they pass in the objects for it, is what they're doing. And then we can actually go through here and, and make calls on it and actually use that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually define a service that we're going to use, which we'll call our. Uh, so I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is I know I'm going to need to use a service to go to the database or to the to the node back in. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to um, define. Um, we'll call it. Uh, we'll just call it service API for right now. And then we're going to. I'll just use the before each here. Um, and then we're just going to do a function. And then in here, I'm just going to um, basically say service API equals, and then I'm going to define an object, which is going to be that service API. And then what we'll do is um, we'll do, um, let's see here if I can remember this now. So we'll say get uh, status. And it won't take anything. And, all, and then what we're going to do is we're going to return, we're going to default an object here. So I'm going to return back an object, which is, this is what I expect my API to do, is give me back an object, OK? So um, when I should have, let me, I'm going to cheat real quick. Because I want to go grab one that I created earlier today. So you guys don't have to sit there and watch me do it all day. It gets boring seeing somebody type. Um, and let's see, test. Let me get this real quick. So I'm going to just grab a bunch here. So we'll, I'll just copy this from here. So and then we'll walk through it real quick. And close that. So. So now I, this is a lot more than what you guys are probably used to. <laughs> One of the things is I'm going to, the service I know is going to basically, my, my service is going to use the HTTP service. So one of the things it's going to do is a lot of times you'll do, you know, you'll call a service and you'll do dot then do something so that when the call returns, go do something. So in order for us to mock that, we need to actually use the, uh, the, Q, the dollar sign Q service for promises so that we can create a promise and then we can fulfill or resolve that promise as we go through. So that's what the queue and the deferred is going to be used for. And then these variables is just what I'm going to use to hold 
the data that we're sending back and forth, the settings, the status, and the profiles. And then I'm basically this before each function just sets all that up. So I basically just assign my, my data object. And I think if I do uh, L here, it probably, um, let's do the whole file here. Oh, I didn't break everything down, but um, this is basically just a long-winded JSON object that has data values in it. Um, in the same way with the status. The status is basically what happens is when you go out and you say, give me the temperature status, it says, here's the time I took the temperature. Here's the temperature in degrees Celsius. Here it is in Fahrenheit. Is it heating? Yes or no? Uh, and then I also have a um, PID algorithm that actually tracks it. So as it gets closer and closer to the temperature, it'll cut back on the amount of power that it uses. So that gives me the PID output because is it driving it full force or is it driving at a lower percentage? And then what temperature am I trying to get to, which is the set temperature? And then if I have a mash profile running, then it'll have the current mash step and the current mash temperature and how many minutes it's been running. So, um, so that's kind of the status that I have coming back. The other one is all the settings. So like on the old uh, Netduino, I had to basically have settings for the, the networking, whether I wanted to use DHCP or a static IP address, what the NetBIOS name was, to synchronize it up with the internet time so that I actually got actual real values instead of ticks from when I plugged it in. You know, I used the NNTP service. So all that stuff was in the settings. So that's what that is. There's also things to change the different values for the PID variables and for the probe offsets and that. And then the profiles is like I was talking before, you know, I want to go to this temperature and I want you to hold it for this, this length of amount of time for 20 minutes, you know, and then go to the next one. So that's what the profiles are. So what our, what our mock service is going to do is basically give us the same thing we would have if we had the real service in place, but it's going to give us back mock data. And where we don't care about data, we'll have that method there and we'll just return back. So like all our posts and, uh, and puts, we don't really care what they post or put. All we're really looking for right now is do they make that call, do they pass in the data type of thing. So if you notice like my get settings method here, you know, now, because we want a return value on what comes back, because that's the way we'll code it, is we'll do a get settings and then dot then, and we'll do something as a success clause or a, um, an error clause, then I need to actually create a promise that we can, we can mock and give back to the controller. So what, the way we do that is we go ahead and we do q.defer and assign that to that global variable defer, and then we return the promise on the on the defer uh, the deferred object. So that basically is going to be returned back to whoever's calling it from JavaScript. And when when we call, go later on and say um, deferred dot resolve and put the data in there, then the then method will be called the success or the success method. You can either do then and pass in a success and a failure method. Or you could do dot success and dot error, however you want to do it. Otherwise, what you get back if you don't do this and you use the, HT, the dollar sign HTTP class is you get the promise and the result. So you get the, the status and everything else. Well, you, you don't want to give that back to your controller because your controller really all it cares about is I just want the data. I don't care whether it was a 200 status or what the headers were or if there were cookies and stuff like that. So this, this way, we can actually just give back the data from the request in our service. Um, and then the update setting, since that's a, that's a one way to the server, we don't really care about a return back. We could, if we wanted to throw an error and say we want to handle the error and try to reload. But for what I'm doing here, it's very basic. We're just, we want data back. And when we send something, as long as it succeeds, we're good. And the get status, so, so all my get methods pretty much do the same thing. We're going to basically create a deferred object, and then we're going to return back the promise on that deferred object. Now I'll show you how to use that. So, so, so my, so my, just so you know, my service API is get settings, update settings, get status, update target temperature. 
So if I want to change the temperature, if I, if, if I want to change it from 120 degrees, I want it to be 200 degrees, then I can send this to it and say, you know, set, set the target temperature to 220 degrees. Um, get MASH Pro and up, update MASH Profile. So it's a very basic, simple thing. And what that does is basically the Raspberry Pi will be sitting there running in a loop, watching that temperature, and then turn things on or off based on that. Okay, so what we need to do now is I need to tell my controller, I need to pass this into my controller, right? So what we're going to do also is we're going to pass in on this inject the um, API settings here. What was it? Our API service. Well, actually, I don't even need to pass it in. I sits it's what do we got going on now? Oh, great. Okay, so all I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in here, um, I'm going to call it um, actually, let me call it something different so you realize I'm actually doing something different. So we'll call this um, So, so what this, so what I've done here now is that's actually going to be the second parameter that would be sent to my controller when it gets instantiated, the API service. And since I basically called, I'm going to make it back in service so that we're always passing in something different. So you can see how I can replace what is injected with whatever we want it to. So this, so this will work for that. Now, the next thing we're going to do is. Initially, the main controller, what it should do, uh, we, don't, we don't really care about the uh, list of awesome things, so we'll go ahead and delete that, and we'll start from scratch here. And the first thing it should do is it uh, should request the current status when uh, created. So what we're going to do is we start with a spy. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a spy in Jasmine, but what we're going to do is we're going to, Jasmine gives you the ability to say, I want you to spy on this object and this method. And you can either return back a result if you want to, you could tell it to call through so it'll invoke, invoke the method, um, or you can just stop it at that point. You know, I just want to see if it calls this. So, and, and then you can then use that in an expectation that says, I expect it to have called this method on the service. And if it has, then um, in a, you'll see here in a second, um, it'll, be a tr it'll actually be true. If they didn't call the service, then it'll be false. So what we're going to do is we're going to spy on the API service. And we're going to... Um, the method that we're going to look for is get status. Is that we're going to, and we're going to basically dot. Uh, I think it's call through here, or is it and call through? Yeah, and call through. So what that does is, so it spies on that, and whenever it's called, he's going to just basically know it was called, and then it and it sent it through. That's not me this time. It's somebody else. <laughs> So now, the way, I, the way I always do stuff is I always create an init method on my controllers to, uh, to always put, package all the stuff that should happen at the very begin. Because what I don't like is to have all this code throughout my, my uh, controller file that is getting called in between the function definition. So what I'll do is I'll wait till the end of my function and I'll create an init function. And then my last line in my controller will always be scope dot and call the init function. That way it kind of keeps everything clean and you don't have stuff getting called throughout everything. So what we're going to do here is that normally when that controller is actually invoked, this will always get called. So that's what we're going to expect. And when I invoke that, we're going to expect it to call get status. So now what we're going to do is expect. API status or service dot get status 
who have been called. So what, what that does now is it checks and it'll tell you, did it get called or not? So this way I can make sure that my first requirement that when this controller is invoked or initiated, it should go out and call the, the, the get status method on the service. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this and then I'm going to come back over here to um, the terminal so you guys can see this a lot easier and I'm just going to do grunt test. And that's going to basically kick off karma and um, run our test. And then we'll get our errors here. So I actually got a failure, right? One of one failed. And it says, uh, should failed. It says object has no method init. So the problem is, is I can close this guy out. We don't need him up for right now. So the problem is, is that when we called init on the scope, it failed, right? Because I don't have an init method yet on my controller. So now what we'll do is we'll go back to my main and we're going to clear this out. And we'll add a scope.init method here. It doesn't need anything. Nope. Don't need parentheses after that. So I've defined that, right? So if we come back over here now and we run it, he's going to go back through it. Now, I, one of the things that I have is running the Karma by itself doesn't seem to always keep running every time I execute it. So you'll notice it still failed, but it's because get status didn't get called on the service. So we need to provide the service, the, the back-end service to it to call get status, right? So we'll go back over here. Uh, where's, there we go. And we'll call, I think it was back end service, right? That's what we called it. Well, just to be safe. So then we should call back end service. Uh, get status and um, so let's run it again and we have no errors right so it actually it actually went through oh I know we did have a failure let's see what our failure is now oh can't call method deferred of undefined <laughs> because base, remember the get status uh, object in here we're basically we're calling deferred oh, we don't have Q deferred in here so I need to basically define Q so let's add it in here we're going to pass in the dollar sign Q service and then we'll assign it My code is not that complete, but let's see if we get any farther. So it, it, it's successful. Now, um, the next thing is, is that, you know, we were talking about, I'm, I'm doing a particular processing model. I'm doing a then. I expect it to always call then on it. So what we're going to do is... Um, Let's make sure it actually got data this time. So, um, so it well, somehow I my type terrible. So, we'll say it should save the retrieved status in the. Um, we'll just say in current status on the scope. So I'm going to break my controller again here. We're going to go ahead and do function. Type what I mean, not what I do, please. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just grab this guy here. And then what we're going to do is, so I expect scope dot current uh, current status not to be null. So let's go ahead and we'll run this again. We got two of two, so cope dot. Well, that was interesting. I don't remember putting current status in there. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Oh, how about null is not a good one. How about undefined? Let's try that. Now it failed, because we expect an undefined not to be undefined. So, so what we need, need to do now is we need to actually go in and add the code into our controller to save that off, right? So, um, so we can do, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll define, um, let's tab in here. Uh, We'll default it to null, although actually it defaults to, an, but I'm going to go ahead, since I know I'm going to basically use the then, because I want to wait till the method, till the call to the server comes back before I do anything. I'll go ahead and do function, and we'll call it data, and we'll put a semicolon after this, and then we'll say scope.current status equals data. Yeah, well, yeah, it would because it's not undefined anymore. So, but and that would make it pass, and we could have got through it. But I guess if I, well, okay, let's do it that way. Thank you. I'm gonna. Uh, you're right. If we take this in little steps. Okay. Now that's actually probably a good because that's all part of unit testing, right? Is you take it in little increments, you move it forward a little bit more at a time. Having so it's it passed. So now let's write our next test. See now you're just going to have to set through another one. So what I expect the um, let's say, so let's say that we expect the temperature Celsius to be uh, twenty one point one seventy four. So we'll say current status should have a, a Celsius uh, should have the current Celsius on it. Okay. I don't know why I keep hitting if. Okay, we'll just say uh, current status should have the current temperature in Celsius. What's wrong with Celsius? Oh, you're right. Thank you. You're better than I am at spelling. <laughs> okay, so then let's go ahead and let's go ahead and grab this guy here. So we're going to say we expect scope dot current status dot and what did we send up here? And our data, since we know what our data is, we'll go ahead and just grab this. And it was twenty one. 21.174. So what we're going to do is we'll compare it to be equal to that value. So and we'll say it expect it to be. Okay. There. 
it should fail now. And it did, because cannot read the property temperature Celsius. So what we want to do then is we need to go fix something, right? Let's go back and um, let's go back over here to our controller. And well, let's just try this because get status return is supposed to return me back something. So let's, let's just try that first and then we'll go into the then. See if that fixes fixes that one. And it failed because expected undefined to be 21.174. So it still didn't assign it. What it did was it assigned a promise to it, but it didn't actually have anything in it. So um, what we'll do then is we'll go ahead and uh, Well, I know what it's waiting. It's probably waiting on the on the promise to come back, right? So let's turn around and let's make sure that we resolve the promise. Otherwise, because it called get status, right? But we never resolved the promise. So let's do. Um, and see if we get if we if that fixes it. And well, actually, we need to put the data in it too. So let's go get our our settings, right? Our status. So we'll just basically say, okay, resolve it, and use the status object to resolve it. So well, that didn't work either. So. Well, the status off is still returning back a promise, so we're probably just not getting our data back, right? So let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and use the then method because that always seems to work. So, so we'll go ahead and we'll change this. And we'll go ahead and we'll use our then method here. And we want, we're expecting the actual, we'll just call it status here come in on it and then we'll say dollar sign scope dot current status equals status so let's run that and see if we get it to succeed and we got failed okay So why did it fail here? Just says null dot anonymous. Can I read property of null? Okay. Let me look back over here. Now I had this working today. What did I forget since then? That should actually work. Well, when all else fails, let's go look at the solution. Um, let's look at probe, I think. Oh, I forgot to do the root digest. In order for it to actually update and call to actually go through and kick off the stu the synchronous stuff, you have to call root digest for it to actually go through. Um, that's what I forgot. So let's stick that on here. And that actually is in the API documentation when they talk about deferreds and you're testing them. I knew I forgot something. So now that should work. There we go. So now, so now our data is coming back. So we know that it actually truly went out and called it, and then when it returned back the data, we actually got it assigned. So, so that's kind of how you you mock out and build out your controller. Now the other thing is, is it probably should have a we should have an update temperature button so that I can click it and force it to do that over and over and over. So let's add one more method, 
And we're going to basically just take this same thing here, but we're just going to change the method call. Um, I'll just say it should... Um, uh, let's, well, actually, what we should do is still a different one here. So let me... Actually, we want the spy one here. There we go. Because what I, whenever you click the... Um, you call update temperature, we want it to back, go back out, so it should request current status when update temperature is called. And then we'll go ahead and uh, now I'm going to break it again, right? But this will also, this will also show, be a good reason why unit tests are good because what we're going to do is we can create another method called update temperature in our controller, right? But so, so it failed because there's no method update controller. All right. So if we go back to our, our, main, our main controller here, now I could go ahead and I could just copy this and call it update temperature, right? And then we have duplicated code. That's probably not the right thing to do, though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this guy to update temperature. And then um, I'm going to add a, uh, we'll add a, um, a new init function. And we'll just call scope dot update temperature. So what that's going to do is this basically allow us to refactor stuff out. And if if I did everything right, then all four of my tests should succeed now, right? Because I now have an update temperature method, and uh, I have an init method that both call get status. So I get my four methods, and they all execute. So that's another good reason to have unit tests for your stuff, is you can go back and refactor out code, and you can guarantee that it still works. So now let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's create a service, and I'll get into mocking out a service for you. So let's do yo, angular colon service, and we'll call it backend service. So now what that's going to do is it's going to kick it off, and it, if you notice, it created um, my actual JS file for my service, and then it created a test spec for me as well. So instead of you guys having to watch that, let me um, let me go ahead and I'll bring this up, and I'll I'll copy in stuff from my solutions from earlier, so that you don't have to sit there and watch me type all that in, and then we'll kind of walk through it. So. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab all this here. I'll grab from here on down. Oh wait, that's not what I wanted. I wanted control. There we go. Oh, I just lost my module, so let me go get that again from over here. Oh, where is it? How many? Uh, there we go. So, so now, um, let, so I'll just kind of go over this. So, so the one thing that my backend service is supposed to do is use the HTTP dollar sign. Um, service to go out and make calls. So the best way to test that is to use the mock service that they give you called do, uh, dollar HTTP back in. And so what that does is I can set up commands like expect a git command and it should be pointed to that URL. And then I can actually respond with data if I want to. You know, I can respond with the 200 command 
and give data back. Or I could respond with a 400 or a 500. So this way you can actually change, okay, it should act this way for success, it should act this way for failure type of thing. And so, and, and you basically, the respond can be um, your, your response code and then your data. I think you can even respond back with headers if you need headers in it. And then basically what we're going to do is this is just going to call, I'll have to change everything from control API to uh, back end service. So let me go do that first here. Uh, so let me just replace everything. Okay. So now the other thing you notice is there's all these little underscores on the services. This is a way for you not to confuse what's in your service versus what's being injected. So by default, Angular, whenever you prepend and suffix a service with an underscore, it will actually strip that off and then go find the actual service that's associated with the name. This way you can have things like back-end service, which is your, your service and your unit test, you know, so that you're, this is what I'm thinking about. So as you're writing your unit test, you're thinking of back-end service, but really what it is is it's actually, it's a, they, you can pass it in. It's supposed to keep the confusion from what's being injected into your test to what you're actually using in your test. Um, it depends to you on you whether you want to use it or not. But that you'll see this a lot in, in unit tests where people will have underscores around the service names. And that's what they're doing. It's just a way to decorate the name so you don't confuse what's in your test versus what's being injected. So what's happening here is, again, at the very beginning, we're, we're bringing up our modules. So that'll give us all our services and, and all our um, controllers available to us. Then we're going to define variables that we're going to use throughout all the different methods. And then we basically have before each test, I want to inject in the backend mock and that um, Angular JS mocks provide and the backend service. And then we go through and we set up, well, okay, in this case it should make a get call. In the next case, we expect it to post to this API. And we actually expect it to post this object, you know. And then we'll respond with a 201 saying that it was created or whatever. Now you'll notice something here. In both of these, there's this HTTP backend flush. And that's kind of like what I was doing with the deferred and the deferred.resolve. So what that does is that actually flushes the request queue. So, so it's everything supposed to be like in an asynchronous nature, that backend flush is going to basically fulfill everything that was made request. So that, that way what will happen is your call will be made and then this should actually uh, finish up on the back end. Um, and, then, um, and then we have our expectations. Actually, this one doesn't because all my well, you got to remember that the expect is that this expect get and expect post is actually an expectation as well, because we're expecting. Now, there's a there's also a sister method called when get, when post, when delete, when put. So there and and that basically is a default fulfill this whenever it, whenever this calls, I want you to return this value. So if you have a bunch of stuff, let's say you have a a real fancy protocol that's going on back and forth. And all you want to do is test one piece of it, but there's all this communication above and beyond it. You can do you can do in your before each. You could do um, so. I could I could like go here and I can say okay, um, HTTP backend dot when get API slash um, Hello world. Then I'll just respond with a 200, and then uh, we'll just return okay. So now what I can do is, let's say that I'm also going to call um, var value equals 
back in service dot well actually I have to actually do a HTTP call but so if I did uh, dollar sign HTTP uh, dot get API slash hello world then that actually should set the value to that so if I go down here after the this and I say expect um, value to be and hello back at you so then if I run that it should actually give me back that so you could so so that way you can basically just default whenever this request comes in just return back this default thing now what we'll do is I'll go ahead and I'm gonna delete that out and we'll go through this real quick well no the expect get is actually is it's expect it, you're doing an expectation and matter of fact what we haven't seen yet is down here at the bottom after each test verify that there's no outstanding expectations and verify that there's no outstanding request so what that no outstanding expectations is it goes through here for every one of these expect methods on the back end and make sure that if you called it it was actually fulfilled so and if it and so if it didn't happen then it'll throw it'll throw an exception saying that I expected a get to happen and it and it, and it didn't occur and this is going to be our catch-all for for our service until we build it out so and and so when I get it so when I run this you're gonna see that every one of these tests is gonna fail because expect dot get or expect dot post didn't have didn't happen and then the verify no outstanding request is to make sure that if we made a call it was handled somewhere either through an ex a win call a win get or win post or an expect post so um, so if we go ahead and I run this now we're gonna get a whole bunch of errors because every one of those methods are gonna fail because we don't have anything on our test yet or on our service so I'll do I'll basically bring over the code for one so six of my tests failed and if you notice it's like cannot call method exposed of undefined and it's basically can't call the method of undefined well why is that um, that's because the back-end service provider doesn't exist yet so my service isn't getting loaded up so um, let's go ahead and get this fixed then um, Let's go look at our services. Well, first of all, I misnamed my service, right? So I gotta go back and change that. So he's expecting capital B back in service. So we'll take this guy. All right. So let's run it one more time and let's see what we get. Okay, so they still failed, but now you notice that they're unsatisfied request or there's no method. So, um, so we start off with uh, no method gets stat settings on that object. So the first one failed, the next one failed. But also there's another error that there was uh, this verify no outstanding expectations failed because it never called the post or it never called the get. So, so this unsatisfied request, get API settings, was never called. So what I'll do is I'm going to switch over to a different project here so we can actually speed this up since we're getting close to uh, time here. So let me open up recent. And I'll kind of show you um, the service now, so under scripts services so this is actually the service here so all we're doing on this is we're calling get settings is actually returning HTTP 
method get in the URL. And, and so what that's doing is it's actually re returning the promise. That's why we can do the dot then on our, on our code. Um, and then on here on update settings, we're doing a method post. And then the URL and the URL in the data that we want, that we expect to go through. This, this is the, the low level way of calling the HTTP. You could also do the dollar sign HTTP dot get dot post. And you don't have to include the method in that. What I like about this is it allows me to add things like caching, whether I want caching turned on or off. So I can do that. And then um, let's go over here and I'll switch over to um, Okay, so now let's run grunt test here. I think I have one error that fails on this and it's on a uh, directive. Nope. Oh. Yeah. So I'll go break one of my other ones. So let me, um, what we're going to do is we're going to basically rename this to update settings one here or get settings one. So that should fail. Um, so now I have seven failed because every one of these methods that references get settings is failing. So what you, what you guys, um, so, so it's all failing there. So I'll go back and I'll change it. It'll go away. And then actually the service test here, which there's quite a bit here. Is, I mean, there's like, again, they're going through here, update match profile, get match profile. One of the things that this test doesn't do is ensure that my data is right. My data is actually coming back. What, because what's happening here is really profile is not going to be data. It's going to be the promise that came back. Because I'm not doing the then thing there. But if I was looking to see if it actually went and got, because we're mocking out the back end, we know we're getting data back. What we're really looking here is, did I make the call with the right parameters? And did I act correctly based on the response that was given back? So, so like, let's say, um, let's use the, um, let's go down here to the bottom. We're going to grab this. Um, Let's say that what it should do is it should retry post if, if error return. So what we're going to do is we expect this and then um, well, we'll just go ahead and we expect it to happen twice, right? So what I'm going to do here on the end is I'm going to expect this to be called twice or at least once. So expect. Well, let's see. How do I want to do this? Oh, wait. No. So I'm going to basically, uh, this would be a 400. So that would be an error. So then what we'll do is we'll, we'll basically, I'll give it a different profile here. So we expect the first time to call match profile one. We'll say, So what I'm going to do is if the first one fails, we'll say retry post settings to uh, server one on error. So the first time it should go and hit that one. When that fails, then it should make the other call. So we'll see what happens here. So that should break. And if we go back and we run grunt, so it should be down to two that fails. And then what we'll do is we'll fix that. So. So yeah, so basically on the second one, we never called match profile one. That's the unsatisfied request, right? So now what we need to do, come back over here on the service, and let's get down here on this post. So um, what we should do is um, dot error. We're going to just take the same method here. Um, we're going to do a dot error function and we're going to 
call this, but we're going to change the profile to 1. So if the first request errors out, then I'm going to call, call this, other pro, this other server. So now that should resolve the error message and it should go back. Should actually, I should go back to 1 failing, which we're back to. We'll get rid of the 1 so everybody doesn't think I'm writing bad code here. Just something about it doesn't like my uh, my directive here, so just cut it out. And, we'll, and I'll bring in the other project here, and we'll look at that real quick. This you don't do. You don't delete out expectations to make your code work. But it's something weird that I've got going on, and I haven't had time to look at it. So now. The next thing I'm going to show you is this uh, Gravatar Directive project. And again, like I said, this is a, a um, project that I have up on GitHub. And um, all it does is it goes out and it formats an image tag to, um, let's see, where's my... This stuff is in a little bit different place, but um, so so what it does is given this element right here, it's going to basically go create an image tag for us based on an email and a size and a rating and then the default 404. And this is all straight out of the um, Gravatar API. And now, you know, people have added and say, you know, it'd be really nice if I could do buttons too. So I want to apply a, a class to the image so that I can have an uh, image button with your, with your icon on it and stuff like that. So, so given this big long piece of HTML that, and this email address, then, you know, we're expecting that now it contains an image tag and that it would have a certain um, MD5 for, because part of this is it takes your email address and it creates an MD5 hash on it and then sends that up. And that's actually how they look it up and return back the image. So, you know, it, so it should add an image tag to the element. Now, what you guys are miss, what you see here is, so we start out with this. And again, this is pretty much the same scene you saw all night. We start out with our describe, we set up any variables, we include the module that we're going to test, and then we inject things into it. So in this case here, we're using the root scope because a directive has to have a scope provided for it. And then we're going to use the compile service, which is going to allow us to compile that element like Angular does whenever it repaints the page. And so this gives us the ability to create an Angular element with a piece of HTML and then call compile on that and provided a scope. And then it will actually execute your directive just like as if it was residing in the page. So this is, this is the big key right here is, is this guy here, you start off with create an element, define your scope and put everything in your scope that you need to, you need to provide it to that, that directive. And then you call compile with it and then you call scope.digest. And then that's going to basically make sure that everything gets updated properly. Um, and, then, and then from that point, you can just basically call things on element and check different pieces. So like in here, I want the, I want the HTML, and I expect that the HTML that came back contained the beginning of an image tag, or it to contain a specific MD5 hash. Or it should have a size parameter because I I know that you know Gravatar expects s equals on the parameter for the for the image tag so and then the rating parameter or PG and then the D and then and then if if you add a class then you know it should have class button here so so all I'm doing is I'm taking and expecting what you know that HTML that came back off of this and that's really all you're doing on simple directives. When you get into more complex directives where you're, 
where you're going through uh, and they're building out, let's say like they're iterating through a collection and stuff like that, you'll have to do a little bit more because you may want to walk through and look at scopes that are sub scopes that are created. But this is the basic on it. And that pretty much puts us right to time. Yeah, uh, UI Gravatar. If you go out to GitHub and you look at Lav and JJ, um, they're all the all the stuff that I ever do on any of the videos and, and anything we uh, any of the projects are up there. So localization service, which I showed a couple months back, and the Gravatar service is out there. And actually, I've gotten more more people actually adding to these because they're actually using it and coming back. Hey, this is this is a great idea, but you know it'd be nice if we could do this or we could do that. So the code's kind of mutated, or, but it's, there are all sorts of little things out there. The same way with uh, the code from tonight, there's a D DIY brew controller that is out there, and that's basically all the, all the stuff that I was showing you tonight that's completed. So hopefully that gets everything for everybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop this.